Hi folks, we're going to be looking at chapters four and five from Brave New World today. Um, remember, there are questions embedded along the way, so make sure you're paying close attention and hopefully you won't miss any of our important information. Um, so starting with chapter four for Brave New World, uh, we begin after or at the end of the workday for Lenina and Henry Foster and Bernard Marx, and they're all meeting together at this point. Um, Lenina and Bernard get in the same uh, elevator, and Lenina starts having a conversation with him that she definitely wants to be public, but Bernard wants to be private. And we talked a little bit about this in class, and that Bernard, it becomes pretty clear that Bernard um, gets all flustered when he talks to her um, because he has a little bit of a crush on her. So um, his face, like we can see that his face flushes um, and Lenina even notices that she's got power over him um, because of how she makes him feel so flustered and uncomfortable. Um, so we see him flushing, we see him stammering. Um, it becomes pretty clear that Bernard has a bit of a crush on Lenina. And Lenina makes a very public display of this first interaction with Bernard because she wants to make sure she's protecting her own reputation. Um, since Fanny was getting concerned that she was only spending time with Henry Foster, uh, she's making sure that everybody knows she's looking to add Bernard to, to her dance card. Um, so we also talk, a, or we also get a little bit more insight into um, some class distinctions. So far we've seen alphas and betas um, predominantly in the society, but we also have a moment where we meet um, an epsilon. Our epsilon that we meet is the elevator operator, and he has this moment where he's really excited to just get up to the roof. And so we can see now how these different classes in inter our casts interact, and our lift operator, this epsilon minus, um, was never acknowledged by the other people on this, um, by the alphas who were on the elevator. And so we get to see how these different people operate um, within the society and how they interact together. Um, we learn in this world that they're not trans themselves by car. Their main methods of transportation are actually helicopters and Aldous Huxley creates this image of a helicopter that did not exist but actually very well mimics what helicopters look like us for today. Um, so Bernard and Lenina go their separate ways. Lenina goes to meet up with Henry Foster for their date that evening um, and we start to see um, some new characters as Lenina heads off into some different areas. Uh, one of the new characters that we're meeting is a man named Benito Hoover. And something that we want to pay attention to in Brave New World are names. You have Bernard Marx. You have Henry Foster. You have Benito Hoover. You have Lenina Crown. Bernard Marx corresponds with Karl Marx. Um, Lenina is a feminine derivative, um, feminine version of Lenin. Uh, Benito Hoover, Her Herbert Hoover, excuse me. And so we start seeing all of these big players in world politics um, from the 1920s and 1930s um, being written into um, and alluded to as character names within our text. So again, when we are looking for social commentary, we want to look at people's names and what that could represent. Um, so Benito and Bernard have this strange interaction where Benito notes that Bernard is acting kind of glum and he offers him a gram of Soma, but rather than taking the drug, uh, Bernard Marx just turns in walks away. Um, 
we have this vision as we are shifting back to Henry Foster and Lenina of Henry taking Lenina up in a helicopter and they are going for this, um, this helicopter ride on the way to their um, date. And so we see for a good portion of part one of chapter four, this bird's eye view of London. And we get to see all of these um, athletics courts. We see kind of from up above how the people move about in this world. And to me, it reminds me of how like an ant farm operates. You see all these little people, um, you watch the traffic, you see how all of this kind of flows together. And it gives us this impression that this society truly is a really well-oiled machine. Everybody knows their place. Everybody knows exactly what um, they need to be doing at any given point. Um, and we see, we'll start seeing Lenina especially talking about um, the things that she's learned through hypnopedia, those little phrases that help instill that idea of prejudice against other castes in her eyes. Um, part two of chapter four shifts pretty much predominantly to um, Bernard's perspective. We're now inside of his mind as he's thinking through the events that have happened throughout the day. So he feels, um, as we see in section or the beginning of part two, he's got downcast eyes and he's not making eye contact with anybody. He hastens across the, across the roof. He's moving pretty quickly. And he's described as being pursued by enemies he does not wish to see, lest they should seem more hostile even that he had supposed, and he himself be made to feel more guilty, or feel guiltier and even more helplessly alone. So we're going to want to pay attention to how Bernard feels about his place in society. We had already kind of... Um, made the determination that he feels like an outcast. And so we're going to see that even more in this section of the text. As he examines more about what's going on around him, he's paying attention um, to these other casts and actually paying attention to the deltas and um, interacting with gammas and epsilons. And we find out that we get a little bit more of a description of who Bernard is and what he looks like. So um, he said to have dealings with members of the lower castes was always for Bernard a most distressing experience for whatever the cause and the current gossip about the alcohol in his blood surrogate may very likely for accidents will happen have, be have been true Bernard's physique was hardly as better than that of the average gamma. So we find out the alphas are these gorgeous, tall, athletic, fit, handsome people, but Bernard doesn't have the same physical appearance as most of the other alphas. He stands eight centimeters short of the standard alpha height and was slender in proportion. So he's not this big built guy um, and he's just ever so slightly shorter than your average alpha. And these physical distinctions to him, I challenge you to look at a ruler, eight centimeters is not that much. But to him and to the people around him, that's going to be a pretty significant difference. Um, so he's reminded in these moments where he's interacting with people of lower castes that he is not quite physically the same as what alphas are. Um, so we get the sense that not only is he not alpha level attractive, but he's really starting to feel like an outcast. Um, and when he feels like an outsider, he then acts like an outsider and distances himself from other people, which causes people to treat him like an outsider and it just perpetuates the cycle. So we'll wanna pay attention to um, 
to that cycle as Bernard engages in it. We get a little bit more sense of what's going on in this world, and we actually meet the one person that Bernard considers a friend, and that person is Hemholtz Watson. So you might want to look up who Hemholtz Watson's name is an allusion to. Um, and Hemholtz Watson is somebody who is the ideal alpha plus. He's um, he works in propaganda for this government. So he's somebody who writes those hypnopedia recordings. But we find out that Hemholtz Watson and Bernard Marx have this relationship where they both feel like they're cast outside of their own world. Um, they both feel different from others in their casts and they become friends because of it. Watson feels like is superior athletically and intellectually to every other alpha, whereas Marx is inferior um, physically. And so we start to see how they capture these differences and create a friendship because of it. Um, so we see this interaction between Hemholtz Watson and Bernard Marx that we'll want to take a little closer look at when we are in class together. And we're going to move on to um, to chapter five. So chapter five um, gives us a little bit more of an insight into Lenina's experience on her date with uh, with Henry Foster for the night. So they are they've been playing uh, obstacle golf and they're off for they're going to be having another kind of portion of their date for the evening so they climb into their machine um, they head off to and they're heading off to the next part of their date and they're observing um, all of these features of the city around them and something that Lenina points out is this she's looking and asks this question as they're flying through the air in a helicopter why do these smokestacks um at the sloth crematorium have balconies around them she's wondering where like why some of the things are built the way that they are and henry explains that as um people are cremated and the gases that are created from their cremated bodies are going up these smokestacks, the gases are actually collected. And so the society is looking at its member, like the people that construct the society, nobody, nothing ever goes to waste. So they collect phosphorus, um, P2O5, so that they can use that um, to power the world and help make plants grow from these burning corpses. And so we see how everybody um, contributes to this whole circle of life if we want to get kind of Lion King about it. Um, and Lenina starts asking some philosophical questions about castes and different things like that. And um, we start to see that she's even starting to question and push back on some of the things that exist in her in her conditioning. And she wants to know a little bit more about what makes an epsilon an epsilon or if they enjoy that role that they might have in their society. And um, as they're flying around, they're heading to uh, the Westminster Abbey Cabaret. And this is where things get really, really weird. Um, Westminster Abbey, just for some context, is a church in England. It's a sacred space. Um, when you go into Westminster Abbey now, you can't take pictures within it out of respect for the sacredness of this space. Well, now we find that the Westminster Abbey has been turned into a cabaret or a nightclub of sorts. So Henry Foster and Lenina are heading to this nightclub. They're going to go um, listen to music. And we find out that in this nightclub, um, 
more than just music is happening. So we get some songs that um, that we hear sung in this society um, and what kind of your everyday people might be really focused on or might take part in in their everyday life. Um, so they leave um, and head home for the evening. Um, which cuts us to another feature that looks kind of like religion to us in this society. And it would be what is called a solidarity service. So we're gonna take a look at what solidarity services um, look like. And Bernard is off to one. He's not super thrilled about it, um, but he has to head off to this big building where he gets together with a group of people and they perform some rituals um, with this solidarity service. And you meet some new people that you're assigned in this world to a group that you would undergo these rituals with. And um, each of these solidarity services begin by taking some soma, making a sign of the T, switching on some music, and um, connecting with other people in this small community group that you are part of. Um, and what it ends up really turning into is, to be honest, kind of an orgy. And there's this whole, we get this really, um, we see this ritual and even though this society has claimed to have eradicated religion, uh, we find that that's probably not the case. Most of the people leave this solidarity service feeling really good about themselves, feeling really good about what has transpired, uh, feeling restored and renewed, but Bernard does not. Bernard leaves his solidarity service um, with some feelings of um, being even further ostracized or separated from the group that he is supposed to belong to. So we'll take a look at um, what happens within these moments for Bernard and um, how all of these things exist within the world to keep everything moving as smoothly as um, as the world controllers want it to. So we'll take a little bit closer look at these new things as we're learning through the eyes of other characters. Um, see you later.